Um, thank you. Please come on stage. I think uh, today's the panel is executive panel on AI and the innovation and the enterprise. Um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll hear from each of the, the panelists here and what they do. Um, Self-introductions, I think. I have a theory as to why the slides of consultants are always in small print, because they want you to hire them. That's why it's really always hard to read. I mean, yesterday from Deloitte and today PwC. Um, but these are the people that tell you what to do, and these are the people that are actually tasked to do it. So um, I hope this panel is going to be very practical uh, for you. You're going to walk away with some insights. Um, so first, uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Benjamin Levy. I'm a co-founder of Bootstrap Labs. Bootstrap Lab is an early stage venture capital firm based in San Francisco. We focus on applied artificial intelligence. That's all we do. That's all we invest in. We look at sectors like fintech, Internet of Things, future of work, transportation logistics. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce this panel today with uh, executives from Inventa, in, Intuit, as well as MANA. And I will turn it over to you to do self-introductions, and then uh, we'll jump right in. Great. Thank you. Hi, hi my name is Donald Thompson. I'm the founder of uh, MANA, which is a knowledge company. Uh, we started about four years ago. Uh, prior to that, I was at Microsoft for 15 years as director of uh, engineering and Microsoft research, working on a number of what I guess would be called smart technologies, uh, personal assistance, speech recognition, uh, wearable uh, devices, uh, privacy-based uh, personalization. Uh, I started the uh, knowledge and reasoning group inside of Bing, where we built Satori, which is uh, a knowledge graph that's induced entirely from crawling the web. It's used to power Cortana and a bunch of other uh, interesting experiences. Also shipped the uh, SQL Server 2012 semantic engine, uh, doing uh, large-scale, unstructured, multi-class document um, classification, uh, as well as a bunch of other interesting technologies and uh, whatnot. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bill Laconzolo. I work at Intuit as the Vice President of Engineering and Data Science. Uh, it's a central organization, and what that means is that we build capabilities and data products for the products to uh, the product offerings to consume and also the enterprise to consume so we build capabilities for both people and for product offerings in real time um, there's a big data infrastructure that of course fuels that uh, there's machine learning platforms there's personalization engines um, unified profile services experimentation frameworks and we're a team uh, that is about just under 200 folks. Uh, Intuit's about 8,000 employees producing financial product offerings for small businesses and for consumers. My name is uh, Jordi Torres. I'm the founder and the CEO of Inventa. I might not be the CEO one day, but I will always be the founder. We are uh, a company originally from Barcelona and we are now headquartered here in, in San Mateo. We use artificial intelligence and particularly natural language processing to help our customers, which are basically big enterprises like Groupon or Ticketmaster, deal with their customer support online. So what we, we do is use this semantic network, chatbots, um, intelligent interfaces to kind of alleviate the, their call centers and try to solve most of the requests online or through applications using our, our technology. And thank you for... Great, thank you. So here. just to set, you know, for the record straight, AI is nothing new. So maybe very briefly, when was the first time you encountered AI in your life? Uh, uh, please don't keep it long, but uh, tell us maybe a, a time and not to date you here, guys. Um, and then also maybe... Um, you know, what is your definition of AI? I mean, I think Jordi has some interesting things to say on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Everybody um, has their own definition. My, the first time I met AI was in 1986. And it's not because of the Terminator movie. It was because I was introduced to the concept of neural network, which was, was amazing. And it's incredible. It's kind of there back, back today. Was that to in me, a university in, a, in back in Spain? Or? It's, it, that was the University of Barcelona. Okay. I was studying computer science. I was specialized in artificial intelligence and uh, back then. And um, artificial these artificial neural networks got very popular, then kind of fade out, basically because kind of lack of learning algorithms um, produced a, basically not very good results, and, and now they're back, thanks to a better, improved learning yeah, algorithms. We'll we, we get back on that. Um, yeah. and, and so maybe briefly, your, your thought about AI, you said something interesting to me. Absolutely. So I believe that AI is this 
area where applications and activities that can only be done by humans are about to be performed by machines. And that, that space is changing. In 20 years from now, if we think about self-driving car, we might not think that this is going to be AI, versus now we do think it. Pretty much as when we take our iPhone and we play chess, we don't think that's AI, but in, back in the 80s, that was a big challenge for AI. So I believe AI is going to change, is going to be always that area that is about to be smart enough to do what only humans can do. And this space is going to evolve all the time. The definition keeps moving. Um, maybe Bill? Yeah, um, so I think when you said engage, probably first experience would be something com um, sort of consumer-based, maybe Roomba or something around. That was probably <laughs> my first engagement, not that sexy, but, uh, but true. Um, and I, th I think similarly on the definition of AI, I, you know, we, ca we kind of view it today and the operations that we do is more of a, if you think about our business and financials, there's a lot of compliance and regulatory. So a lot of how we apply AI and ML is really eliminating the drudgery. And today, uh, while we would like that all to be done by machines, it's heavily augmented by experts. And really, it's for us, we see the, the, at least the tactical future over the next three to four years being more, how do we actually get the experts to actually augment and get the label data to actually make sure that we keep, we keep improving the process, but we haven't yet got to a point where we're fully automated and uh, AI is actually driving our offerings. We see a lot of uh, partnership and synergy between our experts and our end users and the machines. Right. Donald, do you want to? Sure. Um, I, I guess uh, I was first caught with a dictionary and a copy of a prologue book by my father who said that it's more complex than that. Um, <laughs> I couldn't just type in the uh, definitions of the terms and it would just all work. Um, I guess my first professional exposure was, um, oddly enough, uh, I built the AI for a squad-based combat space simulator. Um, so very different AI than my... Um, what year was that? Oh boy, this was uh, probably 88, 89. Um, uh, then I uh, applied it um, in a more, I guess, proper uh, grown-up sense to build an automated loan decision uh, system uh, for a startup in the 90s, a financial startup in the 90s. Um, and I guess uh, under some broad definition, been involved in, in smart and AI technologies ever since. Um, I mean, I think the, the classic sort of simple definition is a, a goal-directed autonomous system. So some system that we can trust to, to satisfy its goals, uh, which is a very broad uh, definition as well. But I agree, it's certainly uh, the changing face quite quite rapidly what, we con what constitutes uh, AI today. And uh, um, yeah, we'll go back on trust, obviously a key element when you talk about applying new technology in the enterprise. Um, so question that's probably on the minds of a lot of people here that either are on the uh, enterprise side or people that are selling into enterprise how much is AI uh, being talked about in the boardrooms and, and senior executives level? And how much is lip service versus it's actually a real intent to adopt AI? You know, I, I put it simply maybe from a, a scale of one to five, with one being we have no clue what AI is and we're not <laughs> even thinking about it, to five is I need it yesterday. Um, where are we? What's happening now? So just as with any technology revolution, uh, there is as much confusion right now, confusion as, as aim to embrace AI. So you, you were talking to the enterprise. By definition, they are very sensitive to do things just because they want to keep their existing things working. So what is happening now is companies are more and more willing to embrace AI at the same time without clearly knowing what it is, which I believe is our mission here is to make sure that we agree on each other in terminology, in systems, what we actually do and we don't do. And um, let's try for this time not go and sell magic because magic does not exist. Uh, artificial intelligence does. So not confusing these two terms I think is very important in order to get the confidence of boards on executive levels for companies and, and move forward. So one to five, where are we? I went in 2.5. Wow, okay. <laughs> All right, not, not taking any risk here. <laughs> All right, Bill. 
Um, so I would say we're on a five as far as the, the dialogue and the expectations. Um, and, you know, Intuit is an organization that the headquarters are in Mountain View, and we have about 20 buildings, and we're completely surrounded by Google. So it's impossible for any of our executives not to say AI and ML at, at any public event ever. Was so the expectations decision? are very high. <laughs> execution, um, I would say we're, we're probably just under a two with regards to execution right now. So I think a lot of what we have done, while we have many models that are in production uh, relative to a 33-year-old software company, uh, we're in our infancy right now with what we're capable of doing. Yeah, I think that there's a, a huge gamut. Um, uh, certain industries and certain functions within those industries certainly have a, an extremely high appetite for it. I mean, we're now, we're now going in to have meetings with vice presidents of artificial intelligence and robotics at banks. You know, and that's yeah, quite. That was a, my next question. Almost like that. Who owns AI inside these yeah. corporations? Yeah, that's right? a, it's I'd a love huge... to hear a little bit about what you've seen out there, because yeah. I think we're going to see the rise of the chief autonomous system right. officer. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's certainly. A, I mean, our our business focuses at the enterprise, and we're we're constant. I mean, we we totally focus on optimizing various complex business processes, and so the question always begins as a business question, not as a technological question. I mean, nobody's running around saying, I have this bee tree, how do I implement, you know, what should I solve with it? Right. Um, so we always make sure that we're solving the right problem with the right set of technologies. Um, and so that's first and foremost. I mean, yes, we have this shiny new thing in our tool chest, but it doesn't mean that it applies to everything that, that we encounter. So I think that's also part of our responsibility from the industry is, you know, dispelling. We just went through this whole big data thing, which, you know, we're still reeling from the consequences of, of that. Um, and there's still this sort of expectation that it is magical, that if we just have a bunch of data and we just get it all in one place and then we can just run algorithms and it'll tell us everything we need to know. And it's, that is so not the case in any real non-trivial, non-toy problem. You, somebody actually ends up having to do work, surprisingly, you know, so. <laughs> Somebody's feeling the pain over there. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll go back on the data side. I think there's been a few comments across the, during the conference here, interesting on the enterprise. Um, so I think, you know, to me it's like, think of it in terms of industries and also within corporations, the different functions. Do you see AI being adopted faster by certain departments, certain thinking of sales, customer support, you know, HR? Uh, and potentially industries, because I know you know you you don't, for example, do a lot of work in in large organizations in the oil and gas field and energy field. I mean, you know, these people have been using you know machine learning and algorithms and optimizations for a long time. So uh, I'd love to hear a little bit from this panel what you guys see out there. I think it's it's very determined by the application. Um, our customers basically use Inventa to ease their customer and improve their customer support. So I've, I had that conversation before with, with many of our customers and say, hey, we don't really care if you have AI or little, small, white unicorns running in your system as long as we have a return investment, we decrease the number of calls, and we increase our conversion rate. And other, other industries like the financial sector has been using AI for credit scoring for many years now. And... Uh, Utility companies, like electricity companies, have very complex systems to manage all the electric power out there, and it's been already there for, for many years, too. Very specific, very applied to their, to their business. And I believe today still is going to be very um, determined by the actual solution and the actual department in charge so of the solution. So still ROI-driven. I mean, Bill, maybe kind of yeah, thinking I, around that. I think for, for Intuit, we're a customer-centric product and technology company, and we, we tend to start everything that we do by what is the customer benefit that we're solving. So there's, there's always a, a tendency for us to actually get into the product offering and you know, have personalizations, have recommendations, and have a better product experience. But the reality is any time our customers have a relationship or an engagement with us, be it in sales, be it in care, um, or in, within the product offering, all of that data is somewhat equal. And this is where some of the big data investments are actually helping us because we can at least identify where are the areas we should target AI and ML right now to actually better deliver our customer benefits. So it actually goes across sales, care, product, product and marketing. And uh, marketing is more around in, in efficiencies, but sometimes those efficiencies in marketing, y you could make an argument that uh, that's a better product outcome and a better product experience. You know, at the end of the day, there's different types of metrics that they're solving to determine that. But we today go across all, and we probably have north of 20 models in production and probably another 25 or so within the next quarter. 
So as someone driving product and, and being somewhat of an incumbent, and no point intended, I think you, you guys have to look at two things, right? You need to look at how you adopt AI across your organization to be more efficient, mm -hmm. and then how you actually develop products, next generation product that will incorporate AI. So you're driving products, so it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting viewpoint in the organization. It, it, it is for the, for the product driving part of it, I think it's, um, as I said, we're, I think we're at our, our infancy because right now we're looking at AI and ML to augment our customer benefits. We're not looking today. Um, I think we, when I say looking, it was we have teams focused on AI and ML as a core. So we're not looking at an AI and ML core for what we actually do today out. We're looking at how do we apply it to the offerings and the benefits that have historically been you know, quite good to actually be market leaders. And I think when we make that shift to say, you know, these things are going to be more probabilistic in the future to do compliance and regulatory, mm -hmm. I think then we've actually made the turn towards we are investing in this technology, we believe in it. Right. And Donald, uh, yeah. again, I don't want to skirt the question because I think you have a, a great perspective on, on the different industries and, mm -hmm. and pain points they're trying to solve. Yeah, well, for sure. All solutions have in common that at the end of the day, you're empowering people in sort of the general workforce, not just analysts and, and specialized functions, to make improved decisions, which means that they're relying on the outputs of these systems that we're building in a way that nobody's really had to depend on software before. I mean, before it was largely data entry applications, you know, I have an invoice, a purchase order, I'm filling these things out, um, and it's fairly rote. But now we're actually making uh, decisions that people have to sort of follow, and that means they need to have some, some confidence that the uh, conclusions and recommendations are sensible. So before we get to this stage where we can just defer all of these important decisions over to autonomous goal-directed systems and say, hey, we trust the system's just optimizing our supply chain. I mean, there's a lot of nuanced um, you know, con considerations in doing something as sophisticated as that. And uh, so you know, we see you know, putting forward these kinds of recommendations and solutions in lots of different contexts, whether it's health and safety before a crew is about to do a dangerous job, what should they be aware of? Uh, getting all of that out of tribal knowledge and into based on what is the data and our historical understanding of these situations tell us. I mean, these are in certain cases life and death kinds of considerations. And so having the confidence in the recommendations, the logic that was used to arrive at them, the ability to explore them further and understand, and then the, the issues that this has overall to an organization to become sort of more data-driven and make sure you have the feedback loops and making sure you can adapt as an organization uh, as you learn and experience using models to drive your business. So we, we'll touch on cloud and data in a second, um, but before moving, I think you always make it very, um, you know, I like to walk away from conference with concrete example. Like if you could share with us like a, a use case, like, you know, and that, one of your clients or yourself have experienced dramatic improvements and results uh, from using AI. I think that would make it real for people. So I remember one of our, our customers, we, we went live um, at like 5 p.m. pretty much. They called us um, next day in the morning and say, we, ha we have a problem. We are basically every day our team in the, the call center agents go and the first thing they have to do is process all the pending emails that we have left from the day before. So, and today we have pretty much half of this email. So this is going to be a problem because you are missing, or you are messing with this, with these emails. So we jump into that, trying to solve the problem. And uh, it was not a problem, actually. The, the system was just overnight getting rid of 50% of e support emails just by leveraging an existing knowledge base. Right. So right there, ROI, 50% of your call center costs. Correct, in two hours. All right. Do you anything specific? Yeah. I think probably some of the most compelling outcomes that we've achieved I can't talk about in detail <laughs> because they're really around protecting our customers' data and fraud and identity theft. Um, but there, there, was some public, uh, there was some public information that was made by the IRS last year that actually called out how the private sector and actually our team uh, delivered uh, models to actually and featureization to actually really help stem uh, some of the fraud that's actually been happening over the last several years that maybe you've heard. Um, but I think what's, what's more important about the, the ROI, I touch on something that, that Donald mentioned, and I think we live through this every time, and in the fraud detection one world, it was, it was quite evident. It's this expectation, and if I had to leave you with anything, it's sort of the expectation when you, when you, when you embark on a, on a mission to actually solve some use case, and you are put into a corner where the team's like, what's the efficacy of the model? What's the false positive rate? What's the recall? And you're, you're having your teams putting these hypotheses out, here, out there. 
And the reality is, it's just a hypothesis, but there's going to be a lot of iteration and featureization that happens, and that's part of the process to get to those ROIs. So I think setting the expectations that you're actually going to solve, you're going to ta tackle that problem, you're going to learn a lot, but you, know, you may be shifting left and right as you go and featureize and actually change those metrics. Um, I think that's part of the hardest uh, part of the hardest problem when you talk about productization of these things. And so that's what startups do all the time, right? They try to evolve in an environment where there's a lot of uncertainty and, you know, yeah. I guess you don't get fired for failing. That's uh, right. Not right away, at least. Yeah. Um, Donald, you want, you want yeah, to comment no, uh, on that? Yeah, case? so uh, a, quick, a quick example. Um, doing work for an uh, international field services organization with 6,500 uh, field service technicians whose job it is to uh, take a call remotely when a piece of equipment breaks down, and these are uh, clinical devices, so MRI machines, uh, x-rays, this sort of thing. Um, and they'll do some sort of remote diagnosis and say, okay, I think I've seen that problem before, it probably needs this. So their traditional mode of operation was to order up a bunch of parts and have them delivered to the customer location. They'd go and then affect the repair and send back everything uh, that they didn't use. So uh, there was some uh, thinking that there was a bit of uh, excess in this overall process and that could be improved. So we did a bunch of analysis over all of the historical data. Uh, and found, in fact, that 55% of the parts ordered were returned, which is a terrible rate when you consider that 6,500 people doing this in 21 different countries. It's all, that adds up, as you can imagine. So we did the analysis over all the historical repairs and inserted into their existing line of business application a recommendation. So when they go to place an order, uh, there's a set of, it makes a call out to our system, it looks at all the historical data and makes a set of recommendations to that field engineer. Now they can override that decision if they want. It's, it's not required that they take it. Uh, but again, we find all of the reasons and we provide the, the rationale behind our decision. And the system's been in, in, in place now for uh, six months and shown tremendous improvements over the, uh, the years previous. But I think we're in this transition, as I mentioned, you know, before we can turn all of our uh, uh, capabilities over to smart systems, we're going to have to go through this period where they start to take over these kinds of functions more and more until eventually there's a critical mass reached. But it's not going to be boil the ocean and we're just going to have smart systems tomorrow. It's going to be pockets like this and it's going to start to compose and build up and planning for uh, the increased modeling and the increased smart capabilities in all aspects of the business is I think really where the appetite is starting to grow right now for these, for these massive corporations. Great, thank you. Um, the next topic is, you know, I want to go back to the data. Um, a lot of conversations and, and passion around data right now. Um, you know, this thing says, hey, every corporation has a lot of data. They don't know what to do with it. But I think someone pointed out yesterday, when you look at the exact business problem you're trying to solve, you might yeah. actually have very little data. That's right. Um, and so can we touch a bit on, on that? And then I think tied to that is, where is your data today? I mean, as a corporation, you just barely managed to migrate to the cloud. Um, and, and, you know, who, so raise your hand and uh, trying to get a feel for, a sense for, um, you know, who is using Amazon out there, right? Who is using maybe IBM, all right? And then who's others, like, you know, Red Hat and others, Linux, yeah? Google. Just, yeah, Google, a Azure, anyone, Azure? Uh, a few hands. All right, so it's, it's seldom, but I think it matters because that as you find, just started to trust the cloud, <laughs> Now you're being asked to trust analyzing your data and making a soon a lot of decisions based upon it. So mm -hmm. can you share a little bit of thoughts around, on the, around that? Absolutely. Um, we have talked to, to companies that say, hey, we have all these gigabytes of past conversations stored with our agents talking to customers. So can you take all these conversations and create a, a, an intelligence that is able to answer any, any question? And what I say is, well, could you? Because <laughs> that's even if a human takes yeah. a thousand years to read all these documents and try to make sense out of them, it's not going to be easy. So you cannot pretend or expect that a ma machine is going to be more intelligent than a, than a human. It's going to be faster. So all this data very often is there, but it's not data. Sometimes it's just text. And I think that's the big difference between being able to bring intelligence or not is, well, okay, is our data actually something that is actionable? Can, can, we, can we take it? Can we process it? Which is not always the case. So I mean, recently Microsoft said, hey, we are now better than humans at understanding, <laughs> not, not just processing, but understanding language. And hopefully we might get there. But. Human language is very complicated. And, and AI has been after 
chasing language, and every time there is um, a certain progress on that, um, we just discovered there's even more and more complex. It's like genetics, right? It's like, oh, at some point it was like, oh, that's gonna be easy. You know, we have this, this structure and boom, we're gonna, we're gonna know everything, we're gonna solve every problem and cure any, any, any illness. It's not true. The more they learn, the more complicated they realize it is. And human language is, is pretty much like that. So how clean your data is or kind of, how can you parse it and analyze it? And so there's a fair amount of work. Somebody's gotta do the work, right? I think yes. Donald pointed out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Bill. Yeah, I, th I think we, we still, so with 64 different product offerings going over, over decades, um, it's still about uh, collecting the data. It's still about pipelines for data for us. And, and what that means is the data needs to be discoverable, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be SLA backed, and, and we need to actually account that, that it's there for us to actually build these models. And the life cycle tends to look like we iterate and have sort of a point of time, here's a, here's a hypothesis, here's a model to actually make uh, make a case for actually getting this into production. And then we typically move, move from if it's batch and it's latent data to here's the efficacy of the model when it's latent to moving to real time. So everything's going to streaming. So it actually, it, it ends up being a very similar story that we've been you know, trying to uh, get that data mindset uh, across and having a data-driven organization for several years, but with the outcome of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence at the end of it. Um, but without the quality data, you know, everything else deteriorates. And for us right now, it's, it's interesting because a lot of our endpoints for high acquisition of data will terminate in AWS, but still the core processing is in our on-prem systems. So we're in this interesting world where we can't really, we need to build the models and to iterate where the density of the data is, but we still, we're trying to offload a lot of the, the high throughput and processing in AWS, but we're not there on the persistent side yet. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I think Donald, yeah, yeah, some interesting Cer points certainly. on that, right? You um, start really with the, the <laughs> business well, problematic before even swimming in a sea of data. That's right. Yeah, I mean, certainly there. Well, there's not one size fits all to any of these solutions, and certain, you know, certain setups need di different sort of data needs. But um, it's you know, we we always take a very top down approach. It's not like you know we've just thrown out the good engineering you know, because we have a, 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 an, a, an abundance of data. In fact, oftentimes too much data is just going to cause you to suffer in terms of trying to deliver a project. So by taking a more top-down approach, you know the concepts that you're looking for. You know, for instance, if I'm doing algorithmic credit, I, I know that I need to have various um, uh, understanding of the level of disputes, for instance, that a customer might have. Well, how do I find disputes in my data? So I can now go in a more targeted fashion and, and look for the data that I need as opposed to, you know, I, I, it would be a terrible situation to be given several terabytes of data by a client and expected to come in the next week knowing everything that they had just given you. I mean, that's a terrible position to be in. So um, instead of trying to boil the ocean, I mean, let's just, I and mean, to, the, to the point about there's still lots of many challenges in terms of getting to human level recognition. But fortunately, we don't need to solve all of those problems to be productive now. And it's like there we can do so much with what we have right now. It's just a, a applying it intelligently and allowing these things to mature and evolve over time. So be sensible about your data. And a lot of times, you need a lot of data to train a model. But once you've trained a model and you understand the relationships across a set of variables, I don't need that data anymore. And now I have the model. I mean, I need to retrain every once in a while. I need to, to, to find out when things are diverging from my expected conditions. Uh, but for the most part, I don't need elaborate ongoing data pipelines in, in all cases. I'm not saying that you don't need them in some cases, but in all cases, not necessarily. Yeah, I think, I think you heard from Danny Lange, the head of machine learning at, U at Uber. He's a friend, and I like how he, he talks about it. He says, look, big data, big problems. Start with <laughs> clean data, number one, right? And then probably yeah. identify lo the low-hanging fruit, because every organization across America right now, big or small, you can identify pain points that are probably the 80%, 80-20 oh, uh, sure. rules, right? Identify the 20% 20 20 of the problems that generate 80% exactly. of your pain, and that with simple, sometimes just machine learning algorithm and will if, drive massive improvements, right? If I, real quick, just, uh, just a quick anecdote. I, we have a, a new project that we just started that is totally unintuitive. It's a reverse optimization problem. If the client has become too efficient in their uptime. So they need to decrease their uptime to become more cost effective. Because if you think about it, it's like that incremental last couple of percent to increase their uptime is costing them an enormous amount of money. So by dropping a couple of percentage in uptime, sure, their numbers aren't as great for uptime, but it, it doesn't cost them as much, and they're okay. They're within their, so what is the business need? You know, if you can understand and, and, and hold your, you know, your folks accountable to the business requirements and needs, then you know, we can have more sensible uh, results. 
so hard to talk about enterprise and innovation without talking about politics for a second. So I mean, if, if, I, if I were to say, what is the biggest impediment for adoption of AI inside corporations today? I mean, you know, you, ha you guys have a bunch of interesting suggestions. Um, um, so I, I let you yeah, take the stage there. I believe that <laughs> for us, our worst competitor is uh, no action and just wait. And uh, th that, this is where we are now. And um, many companies might say, well, let's, let's see what our neighbor does. Let's see what our competitor does. So I believe that um, there is still this confusing in the, the, whole, the whole industry. What is that? Where can I actually apply it? As, as that industry evolves and more specific applications will start to actually um, get clearer and the uh, magic around the whole thing will kind of vanish, I, 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 I think that the enterprise will embrace more and more AI. So you see fast follower strategy and, and, and basically uh, kind of cutting costs and competitive pressure. Yes, right. I believe that's, that's what's going right. to happen. Yeah, so this is, um, for us, I think the enterprise has embraced it and the enterprise wants to do it. I think the hard part is to enable it at scale with consistency and simplicity. And what I mean by that is you get a lot of the business units that will go off and say, we need to do it, we need to do it now, and they'll go off and create a silo and they'll create some different methodology, there won't be anything that's shared, and they'll create some source of truth that then is inevitably needed in an ecosystem right next door to the, you know, the partner on the left. So it's a little, sort of like whack-a-mole to make sure that we go out there and say, hey, we got a consistent pattern, we got a consistent set of best practices, and we can enable this at scale, because at the end of the day, if we can't do it at scale with quality to know that these things are gonna run and they can be trusted, which is the, the, the ultimate what we wanna make sure is that we don't actually erode trust in our efforts, um, then, then we will fail inevitably and everyone will say it's a fad, it didn't work or it was inaccurate. So we really have to be conscious about making sure that we do these things at scale with quality. Yeah, so like that, at scale, quality, trust. Yeah. Um, so make sure that the, the endeavor is worthwhile, right? That's right. Okay. Well, uh, perhaps my perspective is a bit skewed being a small company. Um, we, we really only deal with customers who have an appetite for this sort of thing. So, um, so are there enough of them? I mean, is the market oh, huge? Yeah. No, I, it's defi <laughs> it definitely is. Um, and, and, you know, I think to Jordy's point, I mean, it de definitely there's a group of uh, companies that are sort of take a wait and see sort of approach. They're letting the, the other guys take the risk and, and whatnot. But once that, um, as I said, the, the appetite is, is hugely there. And I think anybody, any company who has a digitalization or a digital transformation effort underway sees this as the natural outcome of that process. I mean, there's a reason to do all of that work. And the, the reason for doing it is to ultimately be able to make better decisions. And in order to make better decisions, well, we need to have mathematical models that understand how it all works and fits together. And then we need interesting ways to interact with this data. So any company who's already down that path, I think, sees this as the ultimate goal. So I'm being told we're running a bit short, and I think we're basically catching up on time for the prior panel. But uh, quickly, one tip for anyone out there wanting to adopt AI in their organization? I believe that any company that will em embrace that has to look into the total cost of ownership, which basically means, okay, besides the solution that I'm going to adopt, um, what is the time? What is the ta my time to market? Um, and how much effort do I have to put in to make it work? And after it goes live or the system is, is up and running, how much effort do I have to make to maintain it? So having this will basically make the decisions much, so much faster. So like any other products, total cost of ownership and ROI. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll assume that we're, we're early stages, we're all in a consistent, uh, consistent phase, and I would say if it's early stage, pick a, a low-hanging business problem and really get a culture where you have a cross-functional team that can go off and attack it. So you get a data science partner with a data engineer, partnered with a product manager, uh, with someone in the data quality team, and you go off and actually solve that problem. You can iterate really, really fast, and then you can start to build to change the mindset to say, look at how fast you know, we were actually to deliver some results here that we never had, we never had a line of sight to before. So I think start with something specific and start with a culture that actually understands it where you can demonstrate the results. Yeah, I think that's, that's great advice. Um, and I, again, I, I would just, setting expectations, it's not magic. I mean, this is, uh, there's a lot of work that has to go involved in delivering any of these kinds of solutions. And I caught the tail end of the last speaker who was talking about uh, having a culture that uh, accepts failure as part of, you know, the, the 
as part of progress. I think that's critical. I mean, if you don't give a project a chance to succeed through its, its sort of a natural life cycle, if you see the first result and it's not to what you expected and you shoot it, you know, then this is never going to happen. So this is all emerging technology. This is all trying to find the best way to solve these kinds of problems. And, and so being, some, being tolerant that, that this is going to take a, a bit of time to get right, we're just at the beginning. As an industry, we need to be careful not to overhype it so that, you know, the, then the first set of results and whatnot, when they aren't as spectacular, you know, they've changed the world and people are disappointed, you know, that this has a chance to breathe and, and, and take its rightful place. Well, so gentlemen, thank you so much. Please join me in uh, thanking the panel here.